these needs unto the Lord and ask him to do a work tonight. Lord, we are so grateful for you. and We're so grateful we can come before you. We're so grateful to even know your name. We're thankful for your goodness and your kindness. We're thankful for you being so merciful unto us. Lord, tonight we lift up Ed Bennington's mom. You see exactly where she's at. You see what she's going through. You see what she needs. Lord, we pray over her tonight that you would bring healing to her body. You would help her have a speedy recovery. You would give her what she needs tonight. Lord, we lift up this lady, Becky. You see she's having some feet trouble. You see where she's at. You see what she needs in her physical body. But we're asking you to touch her spiritual body as well. We're praying that you would, Lord, pull her out of darkness and bring her into your marvelous light. We pray, Lord, that you would bring healing to her body and show yourself strong unto her. Lord, we pray over Mike and Julie tonight at Mobley Correctional Center. We pray your spirit would come down upon them, that you would, Lord, intervene in their service and have your way in the service and touch someone's life tonight in a, a new and special way where you give individuals hope that had no hope before. We pray over them tonight. We pray over Boone County. Lord, that great region of Boone County, we pray over it tonight, that you would bring truth to Boone County. You would touch the lives and the hearts of those people that reside there. We pray your favor would be upon that county. Lord, that you would bring support there, Lord. You would bring your truth there, and that truth can be known unto your people, and you would be revealed unto them, and you would get the glory out of it. We praise your wonderful name tonight and ask you to be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. All right. Welcome to Bible study. Make eye contact with everybody. Folks online, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, we are starting a new series on the uh, power of forgiveness tonight. We're going to be going through, uh, actually it's a whole new quarter, so we're start, we're, we've got three series that we're going to be going through, and uh, looking forward to working through these, especially forgiveness, because I think this is where a lot of us uh, start our connection with God, is when we experience the power of forgiveness in our lives when the Lord has called us he's always reaching out to us and we answer that call Peter said whenever they ask him what are we supposed to do to be saved the first thing he starts with is repent and that gift of repentance that the Lord gives to us is what changes our life when we accept that through our uh, repentance and we accept his forgiveness in our lives um, his forgiveness is, is free. We have to accept it. We have to accept it for ourselves. We have to say, I believe that I have been forgiven. Uh, otherwise, we continue to live in a place of condemnation. And I'm way getting ahead of myself. but <laughs> We live in a place of condemnation that says guilt, 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 and shame. And it is not where God wants us to live. And so I think it's, it's, it's very good for us to spend the next few weeks talking about the power of forgiveness, not only for ourselves, uh, but we're going to talk about forgiving others, which is very, it's a powerful concept to forgive others who have, this is what the, um, when we, we pray the Lord's Prayer, forgive us as we forgive others, as we are extending that gift of forgiveness that we have received to other people. So we're going to be talking about that as well. And we're going to start tonight with uh, the, the, the authority, who has the authority to forgive. And uh, if you have your scriptures with you, if you have a Bible with you, that's good. Uh, if you have an, a device that you want to use, that's good too. I'm going to, we're going to run through a number of scriptures tonight <coughs> that we'll, we're going to talk through who has that authority. Obviously, the Lord has the authority to forgive. And we're going to spend some time in Mark chapter 2 talking about uh, a uh, story that Pastor Dustin spent, uh, I think two weeks ago, he talked about his, his sermon was uh, Born of Four, 
talking about the four guys who uh, carried that man that was sick uh, to Jesus. And so we're going we're gonna to talk through that story from this concept of forgiveness. And so Mark chapter 2, verse 10 is, is where we're going to live, uh, Mark chapter 2. And our focus verse that you see there is that you may know that the Son of Man has the power on earth to forgive sins. And that as God in the flesh, Jesus had that authority to do so. And you can trust the Lord to forgive your sins. So we're going to talk about uh, the mercy and the power of God in our lives. Uh, and the, f- the, the, the fact that God doesn't want to condemn us. The enemy wants to condemn us. The enemy is the one who brings the charges against us in our lives. His desire, God's desire, is to forgive because his desire is reconciliation. Big, giant word that's hard to spell. Reconciliation simply means let's bring us back together again. Let's put us back together in a right relationship with one another. He's always reaching, as I said. And as long as we have breath in our lungs, we have hope that he will forgive. As long as we can accept, Lord, I'm so sorry for what what I've done, what I've said, my actions, my words, my thoughts. As long as you have the ability to, to express that, forgiveness is yours. It's available to you. And so I want us to activate that power of forgiveness in us. If you've ever used uh, any kind of a, a, a two-part glue, a two-part uh, product where you have a part A and a part B and you mix those two together and something happens, you get sticky or you get cleaner or whatever that is, that two parts, our faith in him and his love for us draws us together and becomes that forgiveness in our lives. Later on in our lesson, we're going to talk about miraculous interventions, and I want you to be thinking about a miraculous experience that you have seen or heard firsthand. So you heard it from the guy. I don't don't want to hear that there was a guy in Africa in 1968. Well, I I want to hear a personal experience or something that you know firsthand. My mother, blah, blah, blah. My sister, da, 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 da. My best friend when I was in church, da, da, da. Think about this. I'm going I'm to give you that opportunity um, in just a little bit. What is the most crowded place you've ever been in? Think about it, the most crowded place you've ever been in. We've got North American Youth Congress coming up. There's going to be over 30,000 people in the dome downtown St. Louis. It's going to be crowded. Susie and I were in London for New Year's Eve in the 90s, late 90s. Uh, we were downtown Trafalgar Square, and we the, the, the New Year celebration was over. We were trying to make our way back to our hotel. We had a flight in just a few hours that we had to catch to come back home. And getting to the metro, mind the gap, getting to the metro was chaos. Because in their wisdom, the authorities had selectively closed different metro stations. And so we were piled up in this crowd of people. Pushing, 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 trying to get into this metro station. And London was not our city. We didn't know it by heart. We just knew if we got on this train, we could take this train to that train to that train to get to our hotel and then make our way back home. And so we're trying, we're, we're in this massive crowd. And I suddenly realized in this crush that was happening, people are yelling and the, the bobbies, the, 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 the police, uh, the London police, have their little hats, and they're, none of them are armed. They just carry these billy clubs, uh, just like in the movies. And uh, they're standing on the other side of this fence, and they're encouraging us with the kindest of words to step back, step back, be patient, be quiet, chill, you know, whatever the English would say to make us calm down. And it was to no avail. And the longer it went on, the more I realized this is not a healthy place to be. 
And so I started, Susie was in front of me, and I was kind of doing the shield. She was up against the fence. And I started pushing my way backwards out of this crowd and pulling her with me as we went. So I'm just kind of like line backing myself out of this crowd. The crowd was only three or four, five people deep. But at the fence, it felt like claustrophobia, like I wasn't going to be able to breathe. And we, we pushed our way back out, and we're standing on the outside of the crowd. We're like, y'all, it does not have to be this way. Back up a little bit. Once you stepped out of it, it felt great. Oh, this is a beautiful night. This is so lovely. We wandered our way off to another train station a few blocks away, got on the train and went home. But all those people were just like, Rah, like this. This is, the, this, this is the experience that we have in Mark chapter 2. Jesus is in this, this uh, house, and he is enmeshed with people. It is not even, um, it's not even, welcome our, our friends from Texas with us tonight. We're so glad you're here. I'm just going to acknowledge that you're with us in class. Thank you for being here. Pastor, or, uh, Brother Billy Stanley's family is here with us from Texas. Thank you for being here. Capernaum is the, the, the city that Jesus has settled into. And this, this house that he has come back into is just packed, pillar to fence post, elbow to shoulder. Matthew chapter 4 talks about Jesus moving to Capernaum. And we don't think about Jesus having a place. He says at one point, one of the disciples says, where do you, where do you live? Show us where you live. And he says, I don't have a place to call my home, my own. Of course, he's not of this world, so to speak. But he's back in this town. He's been out teaching from one place to the other. And he's already amazed the crowd because whenever he starts to teach, there's a, a demon possession experience where this, this uh, possessed man calls out to him and says, we don't want anything to do with you. We don't want to have anything to do with you from Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. You've come to destroy us. We know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. Of course, Jesus immediately silences him and uh, casts out the, the demon. And the, 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 the crowd is stunned by this guy. Stunned by what happens to the demon-possessed man. Stunned by who Jesus is and what his power is. Of course, Jesus gives them even more to talk about as long as his ministry, the longer his ministry goes on. Uh, we also hear uh, in Capernaum, this is where Peter lives. Peter has a mother-in-law because he's married. Peter's mother-in-law gets sick. Jesus raises, him from, raises her up off the bed. Uh, I don't know if that was to Peter's chagrin or not, but it was nonetheless, it happened. Jesus heals all of these people does all of this work, goes off and, 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 and moves his way through the countryside, and he missed someone. Now, I, I have never thought about this, this, uh, this perspective before. It's obvious whenever he's in Capernaum that he has done a lot of work, and there's still work to be done. There's still people who haven't been touched by the master. I wonder if you uh, think about where you are in your walk with God. You realize that you haven't gotten to where you want to be yet. You haven't found yourself in a place of perfection. God's not done with you yet. There was obviously somebody left in Capernaum who hadn't been healed yet. Just like us today, we haven't reached the place where God is finished with us. He's not finished with the work that he has for our lives. Jesus hadn't finished in Capernaum. And so if at some point you, real, you think to yourself, I, I was at church this weekend and I didn't get everything that I wanted from God, that was my chance. That is not the truth. That is a lie. I don't believe 
that you are given one shot. If you really want God and you miss, for whatever reason, the, the bus doesn't pick you up or you've got a flat tire and you missed song service and that was your chance for a blessing. And you come into church and you're like, oh, God, I, wanted to, I really wanted to be a part of the worship service so badly. That was my last chance. You're always going to have that opportunity to worship the Lord, even if you have to create it yourself. Previous pastor here used to say that if you need to be baptized and you desire that in your heart, you're hungry and thirsting after righteousness, the Lord will put a pipeline in the desert as he did for uh, the, the Ethiopian eunuch for you to be baptized and your life to be changed. He will make it possible. So, Mark chapter 2, we got these four friends who bring this guy who had missed the first opportunity for Jesus to heal him. They're bringing him back for a second showing. Crowds packed into the house. And of course, as we learned during Pastor's sermon a couple of weeks ago, they ripped the roof off, drop him down into the midst of this crowd so that Jesus can minister to their friend. And we need people like that in our lives. You need, you need somebody in your life who's willing, to, who's willing to rip the roof off and do something for you. Think about this for a minute. What is the craziest thing you've done for somebody just in general, I have a few stories of crazy things I've done. Craziest thing you've ever done to help somebody out? You drove cross country to help somebody move in. You dug through the ice to make sure there was water for their cattle. I once drove 24 hours round trip to help my mother move out of a storage unit to Texas and back in 24 hours. It was a long 24 hours. Craziest thing you've ever done. These guys had a story to tell. This was probably the craziest thing they've ever done. Maybe, maybe these guys were the original X gamers. I don't know. Maybe, this was, maybe they were doing crazy stuff on a regular basis. These were the guys that were always getting in trouble all through high school, and, and finally it worked out to the, somebody's advantage that they were just crazy enough to think this is possible and we can do this, what's the craziest thing you'd do to help somebody find Jesus? What's the craziest thing you would do? The most raucous noise you'd make, the longest distance you'd run, the hardest you'd, you'd, you'd bang on a door to wake somebody up to say you need to know who Jesus is. A number of years ago, I was driving down Morley Street. Susan and I lived on the other side of town and uh, it was a Sunday morning, and of course it's Sunday morning, so we're getting here early. So it's early for everybody on Morley Street on Sunday morning. So I'm driving past this house. I just out of the corner of my eye, I catch this flame shooting out of the gas meter. I slam on the brakes, jump out, suit the whole nine. I'm banging on this guy's door. You've got a, your gas meter's on fire. I've called 911, trying to wake these people up. It probably wouldn't have blown up, but still, it's a little dramatic. Beat, 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 beat on that door. Trying to get this guy out of bed. He's not getting up. He's had a late Saturday. And he's certainly not going to get up for a guy in a suit who's beating on his door. Because he probably figures he's wanting me to come to church. And I'm not going. Finally, this guy drags himself to the door. He's like, what? Like, your house is on fire. I got in the car and drove off. Let him deal with it. I've already done all my work. How far would you go to beat down a door for somebody? This is Mark chapter 8. Jesus asked the question, verse 36, What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? We all have needs, but there are only a few that God himself can meet alone. Salvation 
is absolutely one of those. So many times we pray for the Lord to heal us. We have the, 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 the most miraculous uh, medicine imaginable. We can do amazing things right now with, with the medical fields. And they, those guys in those, in those, those uh, coats, with all the, all the stuff that they've got, it's amazing what they can do. But the Lord is the one who gives the increase to the tools that they have. As apostolics, we believe in the power of prayer. We believe in the power of faith, in the healing power of God, the virtue that flows out of him. This is what Mark 16, 17, and 18 says, that these signs shall follow them that believe. Cast out devils and lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. It's not only possible, but we have personal testimonies of what God can do in our lives. Staying right over here. Randall McCoy prayed for me. I was not diagnosed, but was certainly exhibiting signs of, of hypoglycemia. My, my sugar level would bottom out, and I would just about pass out. I would surf sugar levels. I was miserable one night. I can't remember if it was a Wednesday night that he was here preaching. Sitting right over there, he prayed for me, and I've never had a situation like it since. Absolute healing. I felt the, the Lord touch me and absolutely change my chemistry in my life. I believe that. I believe that because I've experienced it. Somebody else, a, a, a testimony of God's healing power in your life. In somebody else's life that you know of, that you've seen. I'm going to give I'm going to give Brother Stanley a chance to talk because he has stories to tell, but I want to give somebody else a chance to share something. Just one. Rose is talking about how how her life has changed. She's not she doesn't have the depression that she has. She has joy. She has peace that you did not expect to find. Amen. Amen. Mental change in a life. Absolutely. Somebody else. Tear in the aorta. The Lord gave her the ability to live again. Amen. Somebody else. Sister Rachel, you've got a story of, men, of, of, of a million. Share one with us. Three times of cancer healed. Absolutely. Yes, he is. Yes, he is.
Sister Rachel is a lifetime of God's provision. Represents that right there. That's a monument of stones that the Lord has done great work for many people through Rachel. Amen. Amen. Pastor. Somebody else. Steve. Awesome. Anybody else? Savannah. Yes. Let me just repeat that. 12 is considered high. Your thyroid number was 381. Okay, so just so everybody understands, you shouldn't be physically doing, like, you, you have no capacity at all at that point. Go ahead. Savannah, you are a, 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 a vision of God's strength and grace, and for you to be able to raise kids and work full-time the way you did, 
kudos. Thank the Lord. Somebody else? Yes, ma'am. Yes. The Lord. And so what about you? We're, we're glad you're still with us. And, and Rose and Brian are too. <laughs> Thank the Lord. Amen. I love these kinds of stories. Well, we're going to take a minute and let's just thank the Lord for what he's done. Lord Jesus, you're so good. Lord, your miraculous intervention in our lives is just, it's miraculous. We can't even thank you enough. Thank you, Lord, for being healer to us. Thank you for being provider for us. Lord, I thank you for strength and grace in the midst of our circumstances, Lord, that you would stand in the midst of us, that you would extend your hand of hope to us. I thank you for being our healer today, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You know, thinking about Savannah, uh, how many times have we prayed that the Lord would touch you? We don't understand why there wasn't an instantaneous healing. Why, why has the Lord allowed you to surf to this point in your life and take you to this point? We don't know. We don't know. We, we, ex we say the healing is the best. Let's give us the miraculous. Give it to us right now. I've got faith. You can do it. And why? Why did Savannah have to go through all that? Why did you have to experience COVID and all that craziness? We'll understand it better by and by. I mean, I could sing the song. The Lord's, un the Lord's understanding of our situation is so much deeper and greater than our very surface level perspective of life. What we do is we give him the opportunity. We rip the roof off and say, this is what you can do. We're giving you the opportunity. Some of you know my father, whenever he was dying, literally hours before he passed away, he said to the Lord, you know, you still have an opportunity to get your glory out of my life. You still have the opportunity. My kidneys could kick in at any time and start producing again. You still have the opportunity. Didn't happen. Does it change the power of God to be able to do that? No, because how many times has he done it? That was not his will for that moment, for that opportunity. What we know is that his will is always best for our lives. Difficult? Sometimes. I'll be the first to admit it. What Mark chapter 2 tells us is that the most important part of this man's life was dealt with first. Because he says, your sins be forgiven. The first thing that we need to deal with in our lives is not the sickness, not the disease, although many times that is an opportunity for God to connect with somebody. It's an opportunity for a door to open in someone's life. We're seeing this right now in the, in the girl from Hannibal, her uh, Logan, who is in the hospital. There are so many people who are being ministered to because this girl has gone through a terrible accident. And just, uh, I think yesterday, her, her parents posted that her, her th um, physical therapy nurse is crying because her progress is so fast. She can't believe, the nurse can't believe the progress that this child is making. They're having the opportunity to minister to people all over that hospital. 
by being in that space. God only knows why Logan and her family are having to go through this. But Mark chapter 2 tells us that our essential need is not healing, but salvation. Scribes, the, the, the religious elite, as I like to call them, throw in a fit because the response that Jesus gives is not healing, but first forgiveness. And two and seven, they are like, who is this guy who's, who's, who's blaspheming? Only God can do this. Only God can forgive sins. And immediately Jesus in Mark 2, 8 understands what's happening. He says, why are you thinking about this stuff in your heart? Why are you, why are you pondering this? What's easier? Is it easier to forgive sin or is it easier to say to those that are sick, arise and take up your bed and walk? And then he hits the, not just the nail on the coffin of their perspective. But that you may know that the Son of Man has the power on earth to forgive sins, he turns and says to the one who is sick, Arise, take up your bed, and go back to your house. And right then that guy stands up and walks out of that house. Whenever God says stand up and walk, you don't, you don't second guess that. You stand up and go. Now whether he danced out of there or he stumbled out of there or he... Bunny hopped out of there. I, I don't know, but he got himself up, and it was proof of what Jesus was making the point. Who am I standing before you? God in the flesh. Jesus forgives this guy's sins, heals him of his paralysis, and in the process, confirms his de divinity, who he is as, a de as the deity of creation of all things. Physical healing proves the spiritual healing is possible. I want to jump back to, uh, we're going to jump around just a little bit because I want to spend some time here on who Jesus is, the, the divinity of the flesh of Jesus. When Thomas confesses who Jesus is in John chapter 20, he says, my Lord and my God. And the, 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 the verbiage that's used there is the same verbiage that shows up all throughout Scripture. When he says, my Lord, it's the same reference in Matthew chapter 1 that an angel of the Lord comes to Mary and to Joseph. It's the same my God as in call his name Emmanuel, God with us. Whenever he says my Lord and my God, whenever Jesus confirms his, uh, his identity to, to, to Thomas and he sees it for himself in the flesh, that confession was not refuted. Jesus didn't say, no, uh, 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 don't, don't get too far, don't, get, don't, don't push it too far now. I mean, I'm, I'm a good guy, but I'm just the son of God. I'm not God. If you are looking at Jesus as simply a, a secondary deity or just the son of God, I want to challenge that today because Thomas was a Jew. So he had spent his entire life, from the moment he was able to comprehend words and sounds, his mother and father were singing to him, Deuteronomy 6 and 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, our Lord is one. And he said that every single day. He believed it in his heart. He knew there was only one Lord. And so whenever he looked at Jesus in the face, he did not call him, you are one of the lords. You are one of the gods. He called him who he had been quoting all of his life. You are my Deuteronomy 6 and 4. You are my God. You are my Lord, and there is only one. He said, I'm, it was as if he was saying, I'm seeing the manifestation 
from the beginning, the one who walked in the garden with Adam and Eve, the one who hid himself from Moses when he was hid in the cleft of the rock. I'm seeing him face to face, the flesh manifested of the most miraculous. Paul says in Colossians 1 and 15, he was the image of the invisible God, talking about Jesus, the firstborn over all creation. Thomas was seeing the image of the invisible God. He had touched him. He'd eaten with him. He had followed him in the physical. John continues in, in his revelation in 22. He says, I saw, John, I saw and heard these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down and worshiped at the feet of the angel who was talking to me. And the angel immediately responds and says, what? No, 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 no. Don't do that. He says, I'm just a guy like one of you. If Jesus was just a good guy, if Jesus was just a, a, a son and not the full thing, he would have immediately told him, don't do that. Don't worship me. Just like that angel did in Revelation, in, in John's vision that he was seeing. Over and over and over throughout Scripture, we see people who are either receiving worship and are cursed as a result, or who refuse worship. Paul and Silas, or Paul and Barnabas. They were in a city, and the, the people were trying to worship them because they had done miraculous things, and they're like, no, 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 we are just normal people. Jesus did not refuse the worship that Thomas gave, and certainly was accepting of what he had said. John wraps up his book John chapter 20, he says, Truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but I wrote them for you that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that in believing this, you shall have life in his name. This is why we baptize in the name of Jesus and not in Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Everywhere you see someone baptized, they are baptized in the name of Jesus. Because there is, the scripture says, there is no other name given under heaven whereby you shall or must be saved. The name of Jesus and who he is, what he represents, has all the power that was effective in Genesis 1. That same creative power that spoke the worlds into existence in the physical spit into the ground and created eyeballs. Pasted mud onto somebody's face, told them to go wash it off, and in the process, eyes grew in their head. Paul, writing, to, writing in Titus 2, says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that Denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present age because we're looking for a blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul didn't say great God and also Jesus Christ. He said our great God, and some translations actually put a comma, our great God, Jesus Christ. Our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify himself, his own special people, zealous for good works. This is hundreds of years before the Nicene Creed showed up. Hundreds of years before they decided that there was three instead of one. And at this point, Paul was very clear because he was one of the most, well, he even said, I'm a pretty smart guy. I know what I'm talking about. And he called it for what it is. He is our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Son of God, yes. We have to emphasize the human deity that is 
the, the, the human identity of who the deity is. He is the son of God. This is what the scripture says. This is what the angel said to Mary, that the, the Holy Spirit is going to overshadow you and you as a human are going to take on the, 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 the deity that's going to create inside of you. But we cut to the chase. Jesus is still God. We have to understand our audience. We, the, the audience that Paul is talking to, the audience that Peter is talking to, saw him as a man. He's just a good guy. And he's convincing them, this is God. We see him as God. Not just a man. And if you think that there's going to be multiple beings in heaven, then unfortunately you are believing in multiple gods. There is only one. We will only see one being in heaven, and that will be the physical representation of God in the body of Jesus Christ. I am so thankful today that he is still forgiving sins. He is still fully capable to forgive sins today. The scripture, in, uh, whenever, whenever uh, in Acts chapter 5, Luke captures the, the, who Jesus is in this place of supreme authority. He says he's to be a prince and a savior as, and for to give a repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. He is fully capable today of washing away sins as much as he was whenever he spoke to that paralyzed man in Mark. And I'm grateful that it is not a one-time experience. How many of you like me, have had to come back to the Lord multiple times. And we're going to hit that 70 times 7 in a week or so. But I'm telling you, the Lord is very gracious to us, merciful to us. We show back up one more time on his doorstep, covered in the mud from the pig pen that we have found ourselves in. And he's like, would you just get hosed off and come in here? I've always wanted a house with a, a uh, what's it called whenever it's the little, the, the shower off the, the garage? Mud room, thank you. It's a mud room, exactly. It's a pig pen room. So you come in, you're a mess. You don't even get to the kitchen. You hose yourself off, and you show up in the house looking, smelling decent. The Lord doesn't take us through the mudroom. Listen to me carefully. He doesn't take us through the mudroom, on the back door, through the garage, take your shoes off. He takes us through the front door. And he says, take, I'll take you just like you are. I'll get you cleaned up. I'm not ashamed of you. Yeah, you made some mistakes, but I'm, I, I'm so happy that you've showed up at my house. Would you come in? And sit at my table. That's the God that we serve. Stand with me today. Blessed hope. And that glorious appearing. Paul says in Titus. Of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. I am so looking forward to seeing him face to face. Paul saw him. Peter James, John, the rest of the guys, they saw him face to face. They, they, they got the benefit of that. But we will get to see him. We will get to see him. Can we just be thankful for what he's done in our lives, whether it's healing or forgiveness or his mercy that he's been extending to you? Can you just be thankful for something right now? Lord Jesus, I thank you today for being so kind to us, Jesus. Lord, we have torn up so many things in our lives, but you are kind to us to renew us. Lord, you're merciful to us to, to restore us. I thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness in our lives. Lord, if there's something in us that we haven't brought to your attention, Lord, I thank you for letting us do that right now. Whatever it is in our lives, whether it's uh, actions or words or thoughts, whatever we've put into our system that is not of you. I pray that you forgive us of it, that you cleanse us of it. Lord, that you renew a right spirit within us right now, Jesus. Lord, I thank you for cleansing our spirit, our hearts. Lord, I thank you for your perfect work in our lives. Lord, we accept that forgiveness. 
as we say we're sorry, Jesus. I thank you for being merciful to us. Lord, I thank you for healing. I thank you for deliverance. In so many ways, you're so very good to us. We love you, Lord. We appreciate you today. Go with us, Jesus. Keep your hand upon us and protect us. We give you all the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being in Bible study tonight. So good to see all y'all. We'll see you on Sunday for worship. In Jesus' name. God bless you.